Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Fullest Podcast. I'm your host, Nikki Bostwick, and I'm here today with Dr. Calvin Ng. He is a natural healthcare practitioner trained in chiropractic medicine, and he treats the whole body, and he treats patients actually right here in Orange County, where I'm from. So I'm so happy to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us. I've been such a big fan and my whole family is and my friends see you. And so it's been really fun to finally get you and your busy schedule pinned down. <laughs> oh, thank you for having me, Nikki. Appreciate it. Yeah, I just, I really look you know, forward to what you share on social media and your platform. And also, like I said, I know people that personally see you. And um, I think like the best way to start today is just kind of getting to how you got into this field of work and really like treating the whole body and getting to the root cause for so many people rather than, you know, following mainstream medicine. Yeah. Um, well, I've, I first started into this journey without really knowing that I was going to get into what I was, what I do now. Um, I, I really just wanted to be like in an industry where I was doing active things like physically active, like a physical therapist or a trainer. And, and then it evolved into me just wanting to help people with their health. Um, and then down the rabbit hole, you know, we go. So when I first started, you know, venturing into health and wellness and fitness, um, I realized that nutrition was a very important thing for people. So I studied a lot of nutrition. I got very into that. I started doing nutrition coaching and uh, I realized that, wow, if people just kind of switched their lifestyle around a little bit, you know, miraculous things would happen. And then I asked the question like, well, what else could they change? You know, could they change other things in their lifestyle that would cause them to prevent so many diseases that people and suffering that people are dealing with? Um, and fast forward a, a little bit later, that was actually like what happened in, in my story was my, my dad had liver cirrhosis and that was his first diagnosis by the way. And that's a Whoa. end stage liver disease. Whoa. Yeah. So he actually, we actually, we all, we all had the flu at home and then, uh, or in my family and you know, he, he never goes to the doctors. And so finally we were like, you know what, just go in and get checked up. You know, we're all, we all dealt with the flu. Like we're all really sick. Cause he was having a hard time with the flu or just in general, because you never went, he just, cause he never went. So that just, was like the excuse to like oh my get gosh. him in. How old are you at this point? Um, I don't even know, like young, like in okay. my teenage years. And, uh, and so he went in, got a blood test and then the, our primary care was like, Oh, I need to refer you to a hepatologist, you know, a liver doctor. Um, and so he went to the hepatologist and then he said, okay, there's nothing I can do for you. I'm going to have to send you off to UCSF liver transplant. And we're like, what do you mean liver transplant? And then he, they, he said that your dad has liver cirrhosis. And I was like, well, how do we get from like nothing yeah. to like this terminal thing? Um, and so we went to UCSF and gone through the whole, you know, the exams, the testing, you know, the evaluations, and then finally they go, okay, so it's confirmed that he has liver cirrhosis. These are the options. It's either you give him, you know, if your blood type matches, it's either you give him half your liver as a live donor or we you? wait. Yes. Oh, whoa. Uh, or, or like any of our, you know, or like my sister, right? Uh, or we wait until he gets sick enough. And when he gets sick enough, he'll climb up to the, the top of the ladder for the wait list for waiting for a liver transplant. And then that's how he's, he can, you know, get well. And I go, so you're telling me that there's nothing we can do to help him get yeah. healthier, to regenerate the liver, to heal, right? There's nothing we can do, right? And they go, no, there's nothing. And his liver is pretty much done. And we're just, you know, we're going to run blood tests and they monitor something called the MELT score. Um, which is a combination of a few different tests. And that determines how sick you are. 
And so the higher the score, the, the, the higher you climb on the list oh my gosh. to get a liver transplant. And during that time, like UCSF, there's three major hospitals in the Bay Area that kind of that, that compete, I guess, if for, um, for organs. So uh, that was a really like shocking thing to me because I, you know, I, I never faced that type of adversity before, not like no health crisis like that in the family before. And so, and that was all of a sudden to us. Um, but that answer that Western medicine gave me that there was no hope and we have to wait until they get sick enough was not good enough to mm-hmm. me. And so that sparked my own self-interest into finding out natural ways to heal the liver, things that just help the body regenerate, you know, and, but the problem was that these things were, uh, not, these things were not accepted by the Western medicine doctors, um, because they didn't know about it. You know, they weren't taught in it. They had no training and then, you know, they don't, and to their claim, there's no research on it. Yeah. Um, so they said that they can't implement these types of practices. Right. And it was all on our own. So I felt re- really lost, you know, during that time. And, uh, what about and, your dad? Like, did he, cause I mean, you're young, you know, yeah. and sometimes parents either like just dismiss what their children say or, you know, if you had the opportunity to get like that going the route of like giving him half your liver. Right. You know? Yeah. I want to learn, know about that. And also just any, (laughs) your background, I don't know what your background is, like your nationality, but is there anything culturally that you like tapped into at all? Yeah. Uh, so my family's from Hong Kong. Okay. So, uh, like Southeast, uh, China, right. That's where they grew up. Then they immigrated to, or they migrated to Hong Kong and then they, in my parents in their twenties, they came to San Francisco, um, and I never, never looked back. Um, culturally it's culturally, I think in the Asian community, it's like more of a taboo to like tell people that they're sick or oh, even though, you know, you know, like you look sick and then you are sick, <laughs> uh, but you just don't talk about it. You, we don't talk about, um, Oh, like you, know, you don't tell illness. others that you personally are sick. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a very, I don't know what it is, you know? Um, so it was, it was hard because it was like, you, you know, you can't really talk to family about it. And it was just something amongst like our immediate family. Aww. Right. So again, feeling more like alone in the process. Um, but you know, my, my, luckily my dad was, is very receptive and you know, my mom's the reason I, I really believe that the reason why I kind of ventured into the health path is really because of my mom. She was, you know, very into, you know, keeping healthy, um, eating healthy and things like that. But so they were now, they were open, right. To us trying different things out. Um, but they were still you know, they were still programmed to believe that Western medicine is, is the ultimate thing for them that we have to follow, you know, if they say no, that we can't do this. Right. So there was a lot of that, uh, battling through, you know, uh, of, of what we should be doing. And, and you didn't have that programming though. Cause you were so um, curious or you know, like, like I, I guess not, you know, I, I mean, so my, my, all my, I got two cousins who are medical doctors, um, internal medicine doctors and, uh, you know, went to Ivy league and everything. My sister's also like really smart, like PhD, you know, now works at John Hopkins. So like, I come from a family of like, you know, a lot of Western medicine. Um, but for some reason, like I always felt something to go the opposite way wow. always, um, I didn't go to the same school. All my, all the kids went to the same school in San Francisco. I, I did not go to that wow. school. Um, and yeah, so everything, I just always felt like sort of a little bit of a rebel at heart. And so I, I, yeah, I didn't, it, it wasn't good enough, you know, and I just wanted to figure out more and the, I, I believe that there were more answers. Um, and I didn't accept what they were saying because I didn't want to be put in a box, you know, and that was just because of who I was. Um, but when I was in chiropractic school, that's when my, my, my dad really took a downhill. Actually, he was pretty good for a, for a long time. Like we, we maintained him for, for really good. He was on herbs and supplements and 
you know, cleaning up his diet, lowering his stress. He's doing really well. But then he had like food poisoning and, um, and that real, and he had systemic, a systemic infection called sepsis. Oh my gosh. He ended up and, with sepsis. Yeah. And so multiple organ failure. And I was there in the hospital watching him like decline, like just in hours, you know, his lungs were giving out his heart, like he was put on adrenaline. Um, and then his kidneys were giving out, he's put on to continuous dialysis. So I kind of watched that whole progression of like what, uh, an, an infection can do. And, uh, obviously his liver was like just done at that point. And so through that whole process, you know, that emotional pain of like him almost dying. And by the way, he's, he's thriving today, Ugh. but <laughs> like... he, he went through like, you know, to a point where they said that, you know, if he doesn't turn around and his organs don't, you know, function back and it, it were, he's, there's probably going to be no hope. Um, and, and you were in was school the lowest, at that, that was, I was in school. Yeah. During that time. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And like, but so Western medicine kind of helped him turn around in that situation or totally. So, you know, he was, he was put on continuous dialysis. All his organs were being supported by life support. Um, but it was still like a waiting game for his body to, uh, to turn around his, for his body to recover. Right. And so they were monitoring him. And then, yeah, I remember one night it was like, you know, they called us and said, this is literally down to the last 24 hours that we can monitor him. Um, you know, it's not looking good right now. So we're just going to have to, you know, just mentally prepare type of thing. And, uh, my mom's the strongest person I ever, like I know, like, and, and she was crying and said, you know, we're going to have to learn to like live with just the three of oh me, my, me my sister and my mom. And, you know, like that, that was a wake up call for me. Cause I, I never seen, you know, my mom say that she's the most hopeful, optimistic yeah. person I know. Uh, my dad is physically like the strongest person I know. And so to see that all happen was, was huge, you know, and that's when, and during that time I was so, um, before all of this, I was, I was like, I, I didn't believe in spirituality. I didn't believe in religion. I didn't believe in anything that I couldn't put, you know, a, a, a tangible thing on. I didn't. Yeah. And I remember, uh, I would always butt heads with my parents talking about this. I was like, you know, like science is the answer to everything. If you can't see, if you can't make it, if you can't reproduce it, then th it doesn't exist. Right. To, and I was so naive, but, um, so I was like hardcore, like into the science, <laughs> right. Whatever it is now. And, uh, and then that day, like I, or that night, I like, I prayed, I prayed for the first time. Um, and then in those 24 hours, he miraculously started coming oh back online. Oh my God, I can't handle that. And That's his organs beautiful. started working again, you know, and he started waking up, his lungs started coming back, his kidneys started working, and to the point where he was able to actually go, like be well enough, barely, to uh, get a liver transplant. And he climbed to the top of that Whoa. list in, in, in those few days. Um, and so he got a liver transplant and start recovering and, um, you know, that was a wake up call to him too. Cause you know, he, he didn't know what hit him. So through that whole process, you know, it, it taught me a lot about, you know, about life, about, you know, health, about our healthcare system. Um, and I always tell people that, look, you know, like I'm, even though uh, like all the things that I say about Western medicine, you know, I have a deep appreciation for what it is. Right. Yeah. And however, it is not the type of care to be utilizing for prevention exactly. or for, or to, for someone to actually build their health. And so, you know, going through that emotional pain and going through all that suffering, um, I really made a promise to myself saying that, you know, this is what I want to do. I want to help people prevent that suffering if they choose to if they want to um and even when i f i felt like my back was against the wall you know that night 
and then I, I prayed. I went e against yeah. every ounce of my body, you know, where I was like, I don't believe in this stuff too. I got to just surrender yeah. and go, you know what? I, I, there's something beyond me here. And so, you know, when your back is against the wall, you know, you do anything possible. And so that's my message to people is that, you know, we should be treating our health in that manner before we get sick. Every yeah. day we should be living intentionally, not like we have our backs against the wall, but with that same intensity, mm -hmm. right? With that same, I want to be better, right? Um, and as long as we put in that type of effort and have that type of mindset, I believe we can do it. So, you know, that, that really set off like to be, you know, a purpose for me and a mission for me to kind of do what I do. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I really believe in the power of prayer and, um, I've come to kind of feel the same as you. I don't necessarily subscribe to a specific religion, but I do feel that having some sort of faith is so important and, and also kind of coincides with like our message at the fullest with like mental health really being like a foundation for well being and, and really like being connected to yourself and your body and, and the rest of the world in that way. But it sounds like such a beautiful, I'm so glad your dad's thriving by yeah. the way. Cause I was like at the yeah. edge of my seat. Um, but what if like, I always look at life in that way too, where it's like the worst thing that can ever happen to us sometimes might be sometimes the best, like, because he was able to climb to the top of the list to get the liver transplant finally. And, um, but I love the way you look at life too, you know, a few months ago when I was at Cone and I didn't want to go to the hospital and you were just like, you need to go right now. And it was, I just like trust you so much. And like what you said to me, it was just like exactly what I needed to hear to, and like Dr. Blair, you know, just to kind of get myself to go and have a completely different experience in a hospital setting of people who actually do care for us and really do want the best and in those situations are there to do their work and what they've been trained in, but not, you know, preventatively. I totally have the same idea where, um, and I love saying like with the intensity of that, because I do think we need to, we need to value, um, you know, our daily rituals and, and the things that we do and, and advocate for them and make sure that we follow through on them, um, as if, they're everything to us so that we continue to commit to ourselves and our healing and our health and well-being. And so that kind of takes me to, you know, just like firing off some questions sure. about like different, um, different health issues that I know people in our community have faced. And, and I know that, um, you know, some of my friends, like one friend in particular, like she told me she came in and you put her on the antifungal diet and I didn't know that fermented foods weren't necessarily great for candida, but at a, or maybe it's just not part of the protocol, but I guess we could start at like candida, mold, autoimmune. Um, can you kind of share like what your recommendations are for those three things? Would they be similar in terms of like a, f a change or a shift that you would um, say to someone if they were yeah. to come in? For sure. Um, so lots to unpack there. And I think that, um, you know, we first have to understand, like, what's the big deal behind these infections, especially fungus and, and mold, is that when in nature, fungus is there, right? Yeast is there naturally. It's supposed to be there and it's part of our environment. And what it does in nature is that it degrades properties, right? So for instance, when something dies, there's going to be bacteria, there's going to be fungus there, and it's going to eat up all that tissue and it's going to degrade and it's going to put it back into the earth and it'll be and that carbon cycle just repeats itself. So if we go, okay, well, why is somebody having yeast? Uh, chronic yeast and chronic uh, fungal infections, it's not because they all of a sudden, you know, caught the yeast from somewhere <laughs> else. And, you know, now it's like, we got to kill it. And then like, now we got to like, you know, put them in a, in a, in a hermetically sealed room for mm -hmm. the rest of their life. It's not that it's, 
It's that there's something causing the body for the tissues to break down. And now that yeast is there as a reaction, right? So yes, we do have to cleanse the body of these things, but at the same time, we have to eliminate what is causing the infection in the first place. Um, when I put somebody on an antifungal diet, and it's, it's purely because I want to lower the amount of yeast or fungus that they come in contact with every single day. A lot of people um, know about, you know, for gut health, you use probiotics and kombucha and fermented foods and your sauerkrauts and pickled foods and things like that. Um, those are all great. I'm a big fan of those things, but the right thing done at the wrong time is still the wrong thing to do, right? So if we, if somebody has a huge yeast infection and we're giving prop, something that has yeast in it, potentially we can aggravate the body, right? The body might go, oh my gosh, I'm dealing with more of this stuff, right? So again, figuring out why they have a yeast infection or why they have a fungal infection is important. Um, decreasing their overall load is important right? Not aggravating the immune system and the, and the nervous system so that it can actually have energy to start healing is important. So it's kind of like this multi-step approach, right? Um, and I don't recommend that everybody needs, you know, an antifungal diet, but it really depends on the person. Okay. Yeah. What, like if someone just came to see you and you didn't have their blood work, mm -hmm. um, what would you kind of recommend the, like, typical thing to kind of start doing right away. Yeah. So, uh, in terms of like from a fungus perspective or anything, I guess anything, okay. any sort of like, um, dysbiosis in the body or. Yeah. So I, I tell people that there's a few constants, right. That we can't get away from. Um, and the, these are just, these are just things that we have to do as a human being. Uh, and, and we really need to be looking at nature this way, our biology this way, because um, we, we get lost in a lot of the noise. So the biggest analogy is that I tell people, I'm like, if we look at, if we look at a whale in the ocean, what does, what does the whale need? The whale needs to be in salt water, right? It needs to, be, it needs to have free range. Uh, and to be able to roam around, hunt for its food, right? It needs to have a toxin-free environment, right? But what if we pull the whale out of water and go, you're going to now be a mountain whale, mm -hmm. right? And you're going to hunt for your food in the mountains, right? It's not going to work very well for the whale. Same thing for our human bodies, right? We need to recognize that there's a few things. Okay, we have the air that we breathe. Right? And now we have toxic air, toxic pollution. So we have to filter our air, right? We have to breathe clean air. Our water that we drink has to be clean, filtered, right? I prefer distilled. And then we have to eat clean food, right? Real food that comes from the earth. At the same time, that food needs to be uh, like filled with nutrients and minerals. Our soil is so depleted. So a lot of our nutrients, you know, we're, we're missing. Um, we have to also have good quality sleep, right? So controlling our sleep environment. The biggest thing that I can tell people is that it, their light environment needs to be fully optimized. What does that mean? Well, nowadays you have, you have blue light from screens, right? You have uh, light pollution that if you're living in a city, you have also what in mainstream medicine, people telling us that the sun is really bad for us. So wear sunblock, cover yourself and don't, don't have sun exposure, right? So you can protect yourself from the harmful rays of the sun. And so we have to optimize all of those. Right. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's not true. The sun is not harmful for us. Right. It was only because this is a very powerful marketing market, uh, marketing tactic, right? To get people to be more sick in my belief. And we need to really harness the power of light, right? Because when light hits the body, it can affect every single biochemical reaction in the body more so than any food, any drug, any chemical can 
light can do that for us, right? So if we're, if we have an environment where we have fluorescent light, toxic light, well, we can take all the supplements and do all the saunas and whatever, right? But we, if we don't change our light environment, we're constantly going to be sick. If, like someone who goes to an office every day under fluorescent light 100%. for hours. Yeah. Yeah. So nowadays we work out, right? We tell people exercises. I used to tell people this. I was a trainer. So I would go, yeah, you need to exercise every single day. Well, where do people exercise? They go to a gym, gym now. <laughs> and we go to a gym. We look like lab rats, right? Running on a treadmill, yeah. working out. And we're under the influence of fluorescent light. You know, what's that doing to our bodies? What's that telling our cells, right? It's telling our cells that, you know, we're, we're, we're meant to express sickness. It oh creates gosh. chaos inside our system. So, you know, this whole light picture is a big thing. And th- I really don't have like one thing. It really is this holistic picture, yeah. right? And then another thing is like, what if your environment is moldy? What if you have, and 70% of buildings, you know, on earth, Ha- are Have considered more. sick yeah. right so you walk into your environment that you, you got sick in and that is going to be an issue for you um, or you walk into your household and like we talked about mental emotional stress and you have poor relationships with your spouse with your kids with your mother or father-in-law or whatever and and now that is a toxic environment as well too so in what we do in the practice of what we call applied kinesiology, right? We look at these three things, which is physical, chemical, emotional, right? And so what we want to do is treat for those three things and control the environment, change your lifestyle, change how we do things, change how we live our life so that we can set ourselves up so that, you know, our cells can actually thrive, right? And, and so that's what I would do. One of the main ingredients in our product line, Saffron, has been proven over and over again in clinical double-blind placebo trials to be an effective form of treatment for depression, anxiety, and ADHD. Saffron has been used by many cultures for thousands of years for these purposes, and now the research is here to finally back it up, proving that plant medicines and ancient healing practices can actually be an effective alternative to pharmaceuticals. From caffeine-free latte powders to saffron baths and capsules, there's something for any modern woman looking for ancient healing. Again, that's code the fullest podcast at checkout for 15% off. I hope you enjoy your new daily saffron ritual. If you haven't discovered Zuria yet, you're in for a great experience. Just like people say, their line of natural products are as intentional in their production as they are effortless in their practice. The fountain of youth is real and it's so true. I love their products so much. I love their products, their treatments. They're 100% natural, botanically potent. Everything is handcrafted and all of it is deeply rooted in Ayurveda. Marta, who is Surya's visionary, put decades of dedication in crafting this healing skincare line. Some products use 45 herbs, 10 oils, goat's milk, camel's milk. She infuses it all with her mantras, moonlight, and love. You genuinely feel the care and devotion in every drop, the same as if you've ever had the chance to visit Surya. Two Surya therapists working in perfect synchrony with body oils brewed just for you. It's honestly transformative. I really love that the balancing face oil and balancing collagen cream, which my husband also uses with me, they use them during their treatments. It's exactly what you can get for daily care at home. They also have healing three pound bath soaks, body oils that calm you, cool you, or energize you. And they're incredible almond flour breads like gingered peach and turmeric at Air One or online. Surya is a wonderful world. I also love their discovery set, which is great for gifting. It's got the cream, the oil, some all natural lip therapy, and a special Kansa wand to apply it all. If you don't know what I'm talking about with the Kansa wand, you'll definitely want to check this out. It's so, so nice when you use it on your skin after applying the oil and the cream. 
Surya is the real deal, their inner and outer beauty. I love it so much. I stand by every product that they make and I'm just excited to share it with you guys. I've incorporated it in my daily routine for over five years now and I'm so happy to partner with them and know them and I know you'll love it too. I love that. I forgot to bring in the kinesiology um, approach too, because obviously if you don't have someone's blood work, that's how you can start working with them. You know, you have the questionnaire, you have that to base off of, but then does every chiropractor learn kinesiology or is it just if you get trained in it? No, it's, uh, it's chiropractic school was there as a very basic thing. It's to get you through boards and get you to pass your pass everything and then <laughs> get you into practice. Um, but it really teaches you the bare minimum. What chiropractors are known for today is treating things like low back pain and neck pain uh, with like adjustments or physical manipulation. Uh, but there's the history of chiropractic is so much deeper. It's so rich is that chiropractors, the profession was developed to help people get well so that they don't need drugs and surgery. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that upset it Western medicine so much that it was chiropractors were put in jail, right? They were accused of practicing medicine without a license. Wow. Yeah. So this guy on my shirt, um, Dr. Reaver, Herbert Ross Reaver, he was the most jailed chiropractor. Oh my and gosh. And he, he ever, just kept going. He kept going. Oh my he gosh. He got put in jail. He Wait, did he, is he still around? No, he's not. He died in 2001, I believe. Yeah. Wow. And he, uh, yeah. And he, he worked, he worked alongside with BJ Palmer, who was the pioneer of chiropractic, who's the son of DD Palmer, who created chiropractic. And, uh, yeah. So Dr. Reaver, he, the most jailed chiropractor went to jail many times. I believe it was eight times. Um, because he was accused of practicing medicine without a, without a license because he was getting people well. And this was the story back in the 1930s of chiropractors was that they were getting people well and this is not acceptable by the American Medical Association. Um, so, and even when he was in jail, he was adjusting people. He was wow. treating the guards. <laughs> he was treating the captain of the guards. That's cool. Uh, he was treating the inmates, people. His patients would go to go. They would go to the prison to get treated by him. When he got out, there would be this huge party and celebration wow. to like you know see who was beloved amongst many. Um, but this is just a conviction of you know, and I and I wore him today to really uh, you know harness that energy of. Hey, we, we really need to stand for, you know, what we truly believe in yeah. and protect our health freedom. Right. And, and to go, you know what, the, we need to be the, the dictators of our own health. We mm -hmm. need to be in the driver's seat, right? We can't let the government, we can't let big pharma, we can't let, you know, the, the, the mainstream medicine, we can't let mainstream media, we can't let anybody else, you know, tell us what we can or cannot do. We have to come up with our own solutions uh, and be that doctor for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right. So I don't know how I ventured into that. Rabbit hole. So I mean like so many things I want to talk about, but do you run outside? Like, do you work out outside? I do. Yeah. Okay. So, so even if people don't work out outside, uh, or at least in the sunlight. So, but the best case scenario is to work out in the sun. That would be the best, right? You're getting, you're getting the natural light from, from the sun. It's hitting your skin, ideally like full body. It's hitting your skin. Your skin is like solar panels. It's absorbing that light, telling the mitochondria of the cell what to do, how to make energy, right? Protecting us from non-native EMFs. So many things that it does. And so that's a healthy thing, right? As we move through, we used to do this, by the way. You know, we used to be outside. We weren't clothed. Yeah. We didn't have sunglasses on. We were looking at the sun. We were in the sun. We were moving in the sun. Um, and that's what we should be doing. If we don't have that luxury of doing that for whatever reason, what, what I tell people is like, Hey, if you have like, let's just say a garage gym or something, you can open the garage door, right? Light is not linear, meaning that it doesn't have to, we don't have to get the benefits of light just because we're not getting the sun directly sh shining on, on us. Oh. We can get 
the the benefits of light just by opening the door, right? As we're driving, cracking the window open, right? Because light is angular and it's bouncing off multiple places and we can still get those light waves in, onto ourselves. Even if you're not directly under. Correct. That's so yeah. good to so, know. Aim to move in the sun. We aim to move in natural light is the okay. best thing that people can do. Um, what about uh, distilled water? Why distilled water? Because right now we have a lot of toxic stuff in the water um, from pharmaceutical drugs to uh, just from people like chemo. People can find like chemotherapy drugs because, you know, people yeah. do chemo and and are under that uh, chemotherapy. And then they're, they urinate and that goes into the water. It gets treated, but that doesn't all come out of the water and gets recycled and gets put back into our municipal water. Uh, and then people drink it out of a tap, you know, or serve it at a restaurant or make ice. Urine with it. goes back into drinking water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's just treated. Yeah. Yeah. It's just treated That's at crazy. a water facility. Right. And blast it with chlorine and chloramines. Right. And goes through a filtration process, but it's, but that's not good enough. Right. So people can find like they can open a tap. And so there's a good uh, if people want to find out more about like what's in their tap water, they can go to environmental working group, EWG.org and go there and type in their zip code and they can see all the stuff. Right. The thousands of chemicals and synthetic toxins that are in the water from radioactive elements to pharmaceutical drugs. Right. To pesticides, to heavy metals. I mean, it's not good. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we shouldn't be doing that to ourselves. Ugh. Um, and you know, we can do things like reverse osmosis, which is pretty good. And I, I have a reverse osmosis, uh, whole house filtration, but I do one more step, which is distilling it. And I believe distilling water oh. is the best way because reverse osmosis doesn't get everything right. Distillation does. Right, you're separating the water from the toxins, from the ions, from the minerals, which then people go, well, isn't that dead water? And isn't don't you need minerals and water? Well, we can put minerals back into water. You know, it's no big deal. And also, we get our minerals from eating our food. Right, we don't necessarily get that much of it from our waters anyway. Right, I mean, what are we gonna do with rock minerals? So you know. It's, it's not dead water. Um, it works. Yeah. It's, uh, and it's clean water. So I really believe that, you know, distilled water is really the best way to go. If people really want to have like the cleanest type of water. Now, if people have a reverse osmosis system because they don't want to do distillation, that's, that's, that's great. You know, but so like at your house, you have the RO filter mm -hmm. and then a whole house distillation not whole or? house distillation okay. that would be uh that would is be, that possible that, <laughs> it, it. it is possible but it's just very it's going to be very costly it's going to be a huge operation like you know i Take would say a while. yeah just drinking water with distilled is is totally fine so is it like under the counter or how do you do uh, it it's a countertop oh okay yeah, so it's a countertop distiller um i've i've shown it on like social media before okay on what it looks like. Uh, it takes about four hours to brew a gallon. So, yeah. And you do it every day? I do it every day. Yeah, just brew oh my, my water. Oh my gosh. Yep. Okay, cool. So the RO is for like whole house, bathing, shower, all that. Right. What do you think about Pristine Hydro? Um, so, oh, that's the company um, around here, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know how they filter their mm -hmm. water. Um, I don't know if they alkal if they're alkaline or not. Um, I've heard many things about them. I haven't really, you know, gotten their water, so I wouldn't yeah. know. Um, but if they are alkaline, then I'm not the biggest fan of alkaline okay, water. Okay, cool. Yeah, because I don't think it is. But I don't know. Yeah, yeah. it's like remineralized and okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think so. Here's the thing: is that I think people really should get like their own machines at home. Because number one, it's not that hard. It's, it's going to save them money long term. Um, and they don't have to rely on like a constant like water delivery source or going yeah. down the block to get their water or whatnot. Right. Um, and then at the same time, you know, they're not marketed about like, you know, their water about like alkaline water and things like that. 
right? Alkaline water can, has helped some people, but I'm not a big fan of it because I think it does more harm than good. Number one, it doesn't alkalize the body. Number two is that it can neutralize our stomach acid and that causes a whole host of other issues like infections, oh like my gosh. the, uh, yeah. And then disrupting our enzymes and then also disrupting uh, our ability to absorb minerals as well too. So that's not necessarily a good thing for people. I've had a I've had people drink alkaline water for a long time, develop like stones on their bodies. Whoa. Yeah, crazy. And then they stopped drinking that and then the stones went What away. about like foods that can do that or juices and stuff like that? Yeah. Can they? Things like oxalates, right? Can can be a source that can cause calcification, right? Stones that develop like yeah. in tissues, uh, gallstones, kidney stones, things like that. So yeah, that's, that is a big thing. Right. So we have this craze, especially in Orange County in Southern California, that like, you know, we should juice and do raw food and like eat our vegetables and do all of that. But uh, I'm not a big fan of that movement because the, the story is not complete. Right. I don't believe that vegetables are bad. Right. That we should completely avoid them. I do believe that they provide a lot of value in our in our in our diet um, to, to eat it. However, there are certain things that are questionable, such as things like oxalates or saponins or uh, goitrins. These are chemicals that are naturally derived from a plant, a vegetable that can cause disruption in our gut, in our immune system. Uh, and some people can handle it. Some people cannot, mm -hmm. you know, uh, some people, their genetics allow for it. So like I ran a um, genetic test to check like a lot of my methylation and in there I discovered that nightshades, which are like potatoes, mm -hmm. eggplants, peppers, um, those are things that I'm completely fine doing. And it's funny because yeah, I have no issues eating those things. But some people, some of my patients, when I take people off of nightshades, their pain goes away, their joint inflammation goes away, their autoimmune starts calming down, their gut dysbiosis and everything starts calming down, right? And it's because their bodies can't handle those sorts of lectins that are in the food, right? Those plant compounds that are in the food. So that's where, you know, the cliche saying we have is everybody is that biochemical individual, yeah, right? And there is no like cookie cutter way, right? Um, you know, for all the diet wars that are out there. Yeah. Or, or I know it's like protocols. carnivore, raw, vegan, like all that. Yeah. But I mean, I, you know, we ran into each other at Firm Farm. I don't like meat, but I try and eat it once a month, yeah. <laughs> once or twice. And, um, and I enjoy it when I eat it because my parents make me kebab and like, I feel like it's the best thing ever. But, um, but I agree with you. Like, it's not just one way of doing things. And I think, um, for me specifically, when I incorporated meat back into my diet was when I started he healing from Hashimoto's, mm -hmm. well, you know, so. Yeah, I would believe it. Yeah. And, I would believe it. But, um, okay, so going back, I for we kind of skipped a little bit kinesiology. Yeah. Um, I know you mentioned, you know, it's like an extra thing. Not all chiropractors do it. But, um, but you know, there are ways for people to learn how to utilize like mu not just muscle testing, but I think it's like just asking questions with like supplement, right? Correct. Um, is it different? Like, you know, doing the sway test, is that different than kinesiology? No. So that would be, that would be kinesiology or what's considered kinesiology. Applied kinesiology is, is technically separate from a lot of that. And that was, that was, Applied kinesiology is a system, it's a diagnostic system, and um, it's actually a technique that, it, and there's a standardized um, uh, curriculum to, that is taught, right? A uh, hundred hours on the basic, and then there's more that goes into it too. So applied kinesiology is really talking about how the whole body is integrated, physically, chemically, emotionally. And the person who developed applied kinesiology, uh, George Goodhart, Dr. George Goodhart, he studied acupuncture. He studied physical therapy. He studied pharmacology. He studied biochemistry. He studied a whole bunch of things and wanted a comprehensive system, right, to assess the body and go, hey, if you have 
a pain, a dysfunction, inflammation, how do I actually find what's causing it? How do I find the root cause to this problem versus just giving you a drug, a medication, a supplement, you know, something for it, or telling you that you need to come in, you know, and get adjusted three times a week. Not that that's wrong, but it's a, it, for him, it, that, again, it's not, it wasn't good enough. So you really wanted to dive deeper. So people who practice applied kinesiology are like the investigators. They're like the detectives that really go in and figure out, try to figure out the truth of what's going on with their bodies. Um, kinesiology then kind of became this thing where it was like, okay, how do I get the body to respond? So when we do muscle testing, we are looking for a response coming from the body. It's biofeedback, right? Oh, okay. So there's a, and what I mean by th is this, when you take your, a blood test, right? You take a blood test and let's say we ship it out to God knows where, it goes mm -hmm. through 30,000 feet in the air, gets influenced by all the radiation, finally lands <laughs> at the facility and finally gets spun. And then we examine the, the, the blood, right? We're only testing the blood at that particular time when you drew it. So you could have like been rushing to the lab, stressed out. You could have been having your windows down, breathing in toxic air. You could have been drinking, you know, caffeine, although you shouldn't be like drinking and, 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 uh, and eating before you get lab work done, <laughs> but you could have done a whole bunch of things. You could have had a thought, right. That changed your biochemistry. So that test is no longer valid for maybe the purpose of establishing a baseline on your body, right? Or maybe we don't even know your baseline. Every day looks different for you. You're a mom of two, right? You got young kids. Your life's crazy. You're trying to run a company. It's like, when, when do you actually have a constant, right? And so we, it's hard to utilize you know, that, that measure because it's not consistent enough. Muscle testing allows you to assess the body right then and there and figure out what is it deficient in, what is it not adapting to, right? Where is the energy not flowing correctly in your body? And by, if there's something that's causing your body to shut down, right? For instance, like an infection or something like that, or a toxin, right? Then you're testing the body to see, well, what can I do to counteract that signal? What can I do to help your body adapt to that toxin? Right. And that goes back to my very first point about the fungus thing, which is we, we need to look at how we can strengthen our bodies to, so that we can adapt better in our environment, not necessarily be afraid of our environment. Yeah. Right now, certainly <laughs> we need to eliminate the amount of radiation and chemicals and things like that and plastics in our environment, but that's not changing anytime soon. Right. What we need to do is look at how we can strengthen our bodies so that we can have better detoxification so that if there are toxins, we can get rid of it, right? And, and that's really what the name of the game is, right? When I do muscle testing, some people, and muscle testing is this like art and practice that's not consistent amongst every practitioner. Um, that's where some of the inconsistency lies. Um, and that's what it is. It's art, right? And yeah. no art piece, no artist does the same thing, produces the same result. Western medicine or mainstream science, right? And the scientific method tries to put everything in that box to go, hey, I want to make it the same. I want to make it so that there is a protocol. There mm -hmm. is a standard, right? And that's why, you know, we see what we see today, which is this one size fits all model, right? Oh, you got this, you got to take this drug, right? Everybody on earth has got to, got to take this, you know, you know, shot yeah. <laughs> and it's like no questions asked. Right. So, but that doesn't work right in mm -hmm. our model. And it um, hasn't. And it, and it hasn't for you. Like, you're like, Hey, how you're. How can, how can, like, like you said, some people might be surviving on just air, yeah. right? Some people survive <laughs> off of like meat. Some people do well just doing a plant-based diet. Some people do well doing both, right? So there's that bio-individual, uh, biochemical individuality 
that we really have to respect. And it's because that there's everybody has a different walk of life and through their environment helps causes their genes to express in a certain way. And then that is the genetic expression that we are testing for, whether it's our blood, whether it's muscle testing, whether it's urinalysis, hair testing, whatever, right? And it's really decipher all that information, right? And figure out how can we actually help this body like thrive, right? So what do you think about, you know, EMFs in the environment and how to, obviously that's just like 5G towers are so stressful when you think about having young children going to school right next to a tower um, all day long, five days a week, and people living next to them sleeping. Like I'm a big fan of turning off my Wi-Fi at night and only, and I have it on a switch, so I only use it when I need it at home. It's typically off, but like five, six blocks away from me is um, a 5G tower that I didn't even know about because it was in a steeple of a church and it was totally hidden. And so it's like, how can we, um, how can we like support our body so that we can block EMFs as much as we can, but also like, what are ways it's like detoxing the best for EMFs? Like what's, yeah. what do you think? You know, we, we, as, as many, like on my phone, I have a sticker on it. Um, put, try to put on airplane mode as much as I can. There's Faraday bags that people can put or pouches that people can put their phones in. Um, you know, there's people can supplement with things like iodine, increase like seaweed in their body. Um, and there's certain binders that take care of radiation. Um, but you know, those, those are all great, you know, but I still really believe those are all still band-aid solutions as much as I still promote them. But you know, where, what I hope that we can get to is that we have this collective awareness of going like, you know what, this is really bad. I am not going to send my kid to that school anymore. Mm -hmm. We're going to look somewhere else. And if it's the state, I'm going to move out of that state. If you know, whatever the case may be, I'm not going to subscribe to that. Right. Um, and I know that's really hard for some people. Right. And I, and I say this also me, I only know my situation. I don't, I don't have kids. So it's easy for me to say than it is for people to do. Um, but, but this is my dream, right? This is what's ideal is that, if the school is deciding to put up a, like to allow Verizon to put up a tower there or something like that, or a repeater, then it's like collectively, right? We have to educate those parents and go, you know what? Yeah. The, the risk is a lot and I choose not to, I don't want to do this. And if they can't get that tower down, well, I'm going to remove my kid. We're not going to subscribe. We're not going to be a customer of the school anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. And what happens, right, when you are, when you lose customers, right, the companies will react. They will go, maybe I should take this down. Maybe we should, you know, listen to them, right? So I hope that we can collectively get there and say, you know what, we're not going to do that. We're not going to, I'm not going to put my kid in that school. And then the tower goes down, right, or that they take it away. And then, and then those people can return to that school you know, uh, and, and we, or we or collectively as, a, as, as, as our society say like, you know what, 5g is, is too toxic for all of us. We got to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not that much more beneficial than 4g. Right. And we have a compromise and we go, okay, cool. So now, and we, and we don't, we don't buy 5g phones. We go back to flip phones or something like that. Right. Yeah. And then we, we just have this insane boycott. Right against these companies that are doing this. And so what's that going to do? That's going to send a huge message to them and let them know that, well, no, we're, we have the money and we're in control here. Yeah. Right. The problem is that we're so used to this like lifestyle. We're so used to what we do and it's hard to, you know, break away from that as well too. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's why we have things like, you know, stickers and stones and you know things that we do to mitigate emfs which again they're all great but it's the same thing going like well is it enough it's not it's not enough it's not really solving that issue it's the same thing like let's just say high fructose corn syrup that um coca-cola 
is using in their soda, right? Causing people to have like diabetes. And then now we have Ozempic that came out that said, hey, you know what? This, this, this treats type two diabetes. And then at the same time, we have create side effects for it, right? It's like, well, why don't we just go to Coca-Cola and say, stop using high fructose yeah. corn syrup. Like, can you use some real cane sugar or something like that? <laughs> right. It, it's like, we, we, we haven't done that. We haven't gone going like, you know what? I'm not going to subscribe to Coca-Cola. I'm not going to subscribe to anything that has seed oils in it. I'm not going to do all those things. Right. If collectively as a society, we do that. I mean, we'd solve our problem so quickly, <laughs> no. but you know, well, what about, Ozempic. Do you have patients on it or are your patients too smart for that? What? For, I, mean, I don't want to say too smart because there are people that are listening yeah. that are probably on it and oh, for the, a reason because they yeah. got, they actually have type two maybe. Right. I don't know. Do you think that there's a need for it? No. Yeah. Like for anyone? I, I don't believe type two diabetes is a genetic condition. I think it's a treatable condition. I think it's a reversible presentation of what the human body is doing. Um, uh, for the most part, I mean, there's so many other things that people can exhaust themselves of before they go into a pharmaceutical, right? And that's not to say I'm against all, ph- again, like, I don't want to sound like I'm against yeah. pharmaceuticals or, or against Western medicine, but it's just how we use it, right? Or the same thing, like, let's just say, like, in the holistic world, right? Going back to probiotics, right? How many times have we heard probiotics are like, your gut health is at the center of your health, right? The reason why you feel terrible is because of your gut health. Do you know what solves gut health? Probiotics. <laughs> so therefore, everybody should be on a probiotic, yeah. right? But if you have an infection and you take the probiotic, that probiotic feeds the infection even more. Like That's not that's counterintuitive, right? I've or you that, take the yeah. probiotic and you, you're not able to utilize it right? Or you take the probiotic and your stomach acid destroys all the probiotics that are there, right? It, it's like we, we take everything kind of out of context, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's what I hope, you know, that people can realize is that, you know, it does take that clear. It's my, my message is like, we have to really go back to living in a way that is consistent with our nature, right? So, with the whole 5g thing right okay you know let's collectively get a phone that doesn't have 5g Mm -hmm. on it right let's petition let's talk to the people in charge right let's collectively come up with a plan so that people understand that there is a huge amount of people that want that don't want this right or want to live in a certain way um, okay, so three th- more things that I want to ask you. Okay. Um, ozone, yeah, hyperbaric oxygen, and we can end with saffron. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, what do you know? Want to know about ozone? Just I love ozone. I started using it when I started going to Cone. Yeah. Um, but I wonder, is it for everyone? Obviously, we're saying there's no one size fits all. But mm-hmm. like, do in your practice, do you use ozone? preventatively or do you use ozone when there's a specific situation usually when there's a specific situation um but if let's just say somebody has a respiratory thing going on you know whether it's the cold flu allergies something uh the ozone will be really good for that right ozone is just concentrated oxygen when you put ozone through the body right it stimulates the mitochondria. It stimulates cellular respiration, helps you make energy, helps you make more energy so that your body can handle whatever it needs to do. And uh, at the same time, because of ozone, it's also antimicrobial as well too. So if you're dealing with pathogenic infections, ozone therapy can be a powerful tool. You can breathe it in through uh, insufflation, you can uh, inject it, right? Like dentists will inject ozone into the gums if there's some sort of an infection with the tooth. Um, you can do what's called autohemotherapy, which is you take your blood out and you put ozone in it, you ozonate it, and then put that back into the body. Uh, and then you can get that systemically. So there's many ways of using, there's ozonated olive oil that people would take as a supplement or even apply topically over, over like wounds or, um, you know, anything that they need, 
you know, healing with. I didn't know you can take it as a supplement. I I like that idea. That's like the only one I haven't done basically. Yeah, ozone (laughs) olive oil. So there's many applications of of ozone. Um, You know, I tell people to use ozone, uh, not from not from a therapeutic perspective, from but for like going back to the mold and mold infestation, is that people are dealing with mold in their house, they can use an ozone generator and run that in their home to wipe out the mold, uh, wipe out the spores, and they can do that as a treatment to their house, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And that is, you know, you got to treat your body, but, you know, if you come back to a moldy house, you know, you're you're not going to get well. So you have to treat the house as well too. So there's many, so I'm a a big fan of ozone therapy. Okay, cool. But like specifics, not necessarily prevention, like weekly or... Because I have an ozone machine because I became mm-hmm. obsessed with it when I went to Cone. And then I started using it like all the time. Yeah. And then um, I just, I don't know, I wanted to know like your thoughts on if it's like, if like three days a week is too much. No, I, I think people can use ozone like every day if they want to. It's one of those things where it's like, you know, it, it, again, we are leveraging nature, right? We're leveraging oxygen, right? Yeah. And oxygen is one of those things in nature that we really need. So we're all we're doing is supplying our bodies with more oxygen, right? Uh, every single day. So I don't see a harm in doing that unless somebody does it a lot. And let's just say they have like a reaction, immune reaction to yeah. it because it's detoxing them too fast. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's where, again, the bio individuality comes from, right? So some, one person like you would be like, Hey, I really love ozone. I see the benefits in it. it makes me feel good. Great. And then some other people might go, you know what? Doing it every day makes me not feel so great. And I go, there's a, some, there's some other stuff going on yeah. that we need to address. Yeah. Okay. I see. And then, um, uh, and like, would you use it in combination with other therapies for an autoimmune condition or do you not see like for hypothyroid or Hashimoto's or, or other, um, autoimmune conditions? Yeah, I, I would. Okay. If there is, again, like if the, the number one thing with like things like chronic illness, autoimmune is that the mitochondria is not uh, functioning in the right way where it can make enough energy to help the body heal itself. Right. Uh, and the body is, the body is that like the human body is a self healing machine. And we, we have to start with that principle is that we're self healing. And then we have to figure out, well, why we're not self healing. And one the, the, the main reason right? The number one reason, the only reason why we're not self-healing is because our mitochondria cannot make enough energy. The reason for why the mitochondria cannot make energy could be something physical, biochemical, or emotional, right? You can have physical damage, right? Like concussions that will, will mess up your mitochondria in the brain. And then you can have toxicity, things like, you know, if we're, if people are doing, um, non-organic foods, right? And they're constantly exposed to glyphosate, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, that it, those are mitochondria toxins that will poison the mitochondria and cause it to not make ATP or energy. And then if we're dealing with mental, emotional stress or un, have unresolved traumas, that can also rob you of energy as well too, right? So it's figuring those pieces out. But going back to ozone is that that helps stimulate, right? Ozone, light, sunlight, that helps stimulate mitochondria activity. That helps it heal. That helps it get better. That's why we feel better doing it, right? But if we use ozone therapy and we still have like, you know, and we're still poisoning ourselves, well, it's not, we're just spinning our tires here. Mm Mm-hmm. So what about hyperbaric oxygen? So same thing, right? That's a concentrated, uh, that's ox- oxygen that's under high pressure so that our cells and our t- tissues can get that oxygenation. Um, so same idea there. Anytime we can increase oxygen, right, we can reduce the inflammation, right? Um, and inflammation is just like things like reactive oxygen species that are in our bodies, these are just biochemical reactions. So, and then we feel the infl- inflammatory effects. 
So when we are under the influence of oxygen and it reduces our inflammation, right, we feel better, right? We feel like we, we, have, we have a positive response to it where people feel more alert, people have lower inflammation so that they can actually function and do the day-to-day -day things. Their mitochondria is working better so that they have more energy, right? Um, and then some people th with like things like Lyme disease or if they have infections that affect their tissues, they see a positive benefit through that too because there's pathogens like Lyme that rob your body of oxygen. They go into, they burrow themselves into those tissues. Oh, okay. You know, and then just, just cause a whole chaos in there. So when we can use a, a hyperbaric, right, it's a, it's a palliative thing meaning that it makes it feel better, right? Is it going to solve your issues? No, right? But is it going to help you heal faster and regenerate? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it can like expedite healing, but it doesn't necessarily solve it. It's Correct. just like supports the symptoms and then helps you regenerate more mm -hmm. quickly. Yeah. So yeah. these are like the things like like biohacking, right? Biohacking is kind of like, hey, you know what? I can I can like turn up a process or turn down a process, right? And so... You know, what we're doing is we're just, like you said, expediting, you know, a healing for a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, it's not, I don't believe that it's going to, if you have an infection, you know, doing hyperbaric every day is not going to solve the infection issue. Okay, and then I know you've done your own research on saffron, so I'm just like really yeah. excited to hear your thoughts on it in general. Because yeah. I know you kind of mentioned it to other people for mental health support before we ever really connected. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you've done a great job on, on like, like exposing all the great things about saffron from like peer reviewed studies to, you know, everything from, you know, historical, uh, data as well. But saffron is one of those compounds where it's really interesting because it's, I believe if the world like just gets a hold of like the, the knowledge and wisdom behind saffron. Uh, I think we'll dramatically see a decrease in antidepressant use. Um, there's obviously there's a whole bunch of other issues that cause that crisis too, but saffron is a, such a unique compound, right? Helping people with their mental health that I think people can really like get off some of their you know medication if they truly were was to consider it, right? On top of everything else that we've kind of talked about, yeah, like changing out their lifestyle. Right. But it is a compound that, well, it doesn't have the side effects of antidepressants, right? It's not a mitochondria toxin like a lot of pharmaceuticals, right? It's a natural substance coming from nature. I mean, all the, in this, in this past hour, all that I've talked about is pretty much <laughs> nature, right? So, yeah. you know, I don't take any credit for it. It's really just, you know, nature, mother nature, you know. God created the the earth and for us, and, and he said that, you know, there's everything here for you that's, that you need. Um, and, and saffron is one of those compounds that we can grow out of the ground uh, to help heal our bodies, to help heal like a lot of our mental illnesses, um, to unlock our emotional brain, right? So I think there's a very positive thing with the use of that because a lot of people are, having a lot of issues with chemical imbalances in their brain, uh, having a lot of issues with maybe even tapping into, you know, their subconscious, their emotional side. And I think that, you know, when we start using, when we start like understanding that, right. And really acknowledging that, you know, everybody has, you know, some sort of emotional issue, right. I'm not going to call it a disease, but just, just things that we can still work on and improve. Right. Could we use saffron and improve that? For sure, right? Um, but I always tell people that we still have to get specific, right? We, can, we cannot, like, rely on one, one thing, thing and be like, it's like, you know, the person who's, like, got constipation is, like, <laughs> always, like, eating prune juice or, or uh, magnesium citrate, you know? I'm like, well, you know, like, this is probably not a good long-term solution, yeah. Although it's helpful, we should utilize this as a tool to help us get to where we need to go and, and unlock those key pieces, mm -hmm. right? So, and I think saffron could be one of those tools as well. Yeah, I love the whole holistic, whole body approach that you have and you shared with us today. And I just appreciate you taking your time and 
thank you so much for giving all your tips and um, please let people know how they can reach you because I know obviously you are seeing patients in Orange County and I think that's so special and important for people to know because I think a lot of times, um, you know, people end up not seeing any patients um, when they start to kind of share more content and share their message more. But it's awesome that you still see people. Um, so let people know how they can hopefully come see you in person or get, you know, onto your um, platform to just learn more. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you uh, giving me a, a platform to kind of yeah. share all the things that I've accumulated. Um, yeah, so people can just follow me on social media, uh, Dr. Calvin Ng, and my website. I have a blog that I'll sporadically write <laughs> stuff when I have some time. And uh, yeah, I like what you said about the, you know, people, you know, that I still see patients. And it's like, I, I, f I feel like that's really where, you know, the bread and butter is of, you know, what we do is, you know, having that one-on-one -on -one connection with people, helping them, like teach them and educate them, but also be there and listen to them, right? And having, it's like building that community. Um, so I hope that, you know, these messages, right, of like your guests and all that is, and I'm sure it's helping people like create that community sense where they feel like seen and heard and validated, you know, for all the things that they already know. And now it's just like growing. So uh, we are competing with content. It's one of those things where we're competing with, you know, mainstream media, we're yeah. competing with advertisements, we're competing with a lot of people, right, on like on viewership. And so I appreciate you for like doing what you're doing. Thank out you. There. Thanks so much for coming yeah. on. And, um, and yeah, you, did you say your Instagram too? Yeah. Dr. Okay. Cal yeah. Dr. Okay. Calvin Ng. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Calvin Ng. Definitely. Um, check out the show notes too. We have links and, and I appreciate you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm.